good to be here. Today is a, a very special day for me because uh, I'm going to be sharing a second message from the book of Malachi. And Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And many, many weeks ago, we started a journey together through the Bible. And at that time, I shared with you a, a, a desire in my heart to walk through the entire Bible, uh, taking each book one at a time and, and sharing a couple of messages from the books. And it's hard to believe, for me, it's hard for me to believe this morning that we are, we are nearing the completion of the Old Testament. And I want to just share with you that we are going to be moving through the New Testament, the same pattern, going through the books of the New Testament, book by book, sharing a couple of messages from each of those books. I also want to tell you something I'm excited to do in between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm actually going to be sharing a couple of messages uh, about what took place between the Old Testament and the New Testament because it is important for us when we get into the Gospels and we start to learn about uh, the birth, the life of Jesus, his life here on the earth, his ministry, his death, his bur burial, resurrection. Uh, when you start to get into that time frame, there's a lot of, of, uh, of, of critical information uh, that helps us understand what takes place in the Gospels drawn from that 400-year period between the Testaments. So I'm going to take a couple of, of, of weeks to talk about some of, of the impact of the times on the arrival of Jesus and, and the information in the Gospels about the good news of salvation and our Lord Jesus Christ. So... Uh, just to prepare you, what's coming, uh, look forward to getting into the New Testament, look forward to uh, really seeing how we hear from God in the New Testament, much like we've heard from him in the Old Testament. We started this journey by saying we want to see what the Word has to say about who God is, and we want to learn about the truth of our own identity in God. We also want to learn about what he has to say about a relationship. Now, this morning... I want to just say a word before we get into our text in Malachi. I want to say something about how God is revealed to us. God is revealed in a number of ways in the Old Testament. Today, as we get into Malachi, and in particular, we're going to look at a, a passage in Malachi that will show us God as something of a, of a, of a craftsman, as an artist, as a judge... As, as a God who, who takes a, a hands-on approach in our lives, so to speak. And I find that interesting because when you begin in the Old Testament in Genesis, when we started there, Genesis 127 says that God created us in His image. That God created male and female in His image. God created us. And I like to, to, for us to reflect on that for a moment as we go from the first book of the Old Testament in Genesis to the last book of the Old Testament in Malachi, because I think it begins in Genesis with this, with this revelation of who God is as creator. God created us. And that creative, that creative character of God is one that we see evident throughout the Old Testament. And so it wouldn't be surprising to find that in the last book in Malachi, as God is described as, as two things. First of all, as a refiner, as a refiner's fire, as one who still is involved in, in, in making us beautiful and making us pure. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But also as soap, as, as a cleansing agent, so that God can cleanse us and purify us in that way as well. But before we talk about that, I want to take you for a moment to Malachi, and I want to share a, a verse, verse 17, in the second chapter of Malachi, because this helps us to understand something about God, as that, that God who is, is personally involved, as that God who is a, a craftsman, as, as, as a potter, as we, we saw in our video today, as God who works in us and shapes us and transforms us. And, and, and makes us more like him. As that God, it's, it's interesting as you look at Malachi, that Malachi, as the last book in the Old Testament, prepares us for, for God's greatest intervention at all, and that is the coming of the Savior, Jesus. 
Malachi prepares us. In fact, I would say Malachi anticipates the coming of Jesus. And, and Jesus, is, Jesus is the ultimate when it comes to God revealing and God speaking and God intervening and God coming near to us. Jesus is the ultimate testimony of our God in that way. And so Malachi prepares us for the Lord's coming, and he does it in a magnificent way. But I want to look at verse 17 here because there's an interesting question that comes in Malachi 2.17. Listen to the question as it comes. It's set up this way. You have wearied the Lord with your words. And this is a back and forth between God and the people. How have we wearied him, you ask? God responds by saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and, and, and that he is pleased with them. So in this back and forth, God says, you have, have wearied the Lord. And, and the response is, how? How have we wearied the Lord? And God says, by, by saying those that do evil are good. And then here comes the question. And I find this question fascinating. The question is this, where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? Now, that's a big question to ask. That's a big question. Where is God? And not just where is God, but where is the God of justice? Where is the God who, who keeps track of things? Where is the God who makes things right? Now, if you listen carefully to the words that we find in Malachi, you'll know that this is a, this is a selfish question. There's a... There's a selfish bent in this question. They're asking, where is God? Where is the God of justice? Where is the God who will set things right? Where is the God? But they're asking in such a way, we know their pattern has been, that God, I want, you to, I want you to set things right, but I want you to set them right in the way I want them to be right. Now, we do that, don't we? Sometimes we cry for justice, but we cry for our own version of justice. We, we cry for God to intervene, but we want God to intervene the way we want God to intervene. We haven't totally surrendered to God as the Almighty, the Sovereign, the God who does know right from wrong, and, and the God who has revealed Himself, and He's revealed what is right and what is wrong. We cry for God's intervention, but there's a selfishness in that. But the God of justice is, is that. He is the God of justice. They ask the question, well, if you ask God a question, and I've always said it's fine to ask God questions, but you better be prepared for the answer. It's okay to question God. I'm not a pastor that says don't ever ask why, don't ever question God, don't bring hard questions to God. I think it's wonderful. In fact, that's a great way to learn by asking questions. But if you ask God a question, be prepared for the answer because because God is, is more than capable of responding. Now listen, as you go through this, you see they've distorted good and evil. They, they have a selfish bent in the way that they've lived and the questioning they've brought before God. So Malachi provides us with a prophetic answer from God. And listen, here's what he says in chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3. He says this, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So, so, so God says, I will send a messenger. And the Lord, the Lord you seek is going to come. I will come. But listen to what he says next. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand? When he appears, they say, where is the God of justice? Where, where is the God of justice? God, wh why don't you come on the scene? God, why will you not intervene? Why do you fail to bring justice? God, where are you? And the Lord answers and says, I'm coming. I'm sending a messenger, and I am coming. But then God asks a better question. Who will be able to stand? When I come, who, who's fit to stand in my presence? Who can stand before me? Now listen, he says here, for 
He will be like a refiner's fire. He will be like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. So they ask, where is God? And God's answer is, oh God, God says, I am coming. So, so Malachi points toward the coming of a Savior, the coming of a Redeemer. And God says, I am coming I am coming, but when I come, who will stand? When I come, who will be able to to withstand my presence? Who will be able to stand before me? Because God is a holy God. God God is a righteous God. God is the God of justice. And are we fit to stand before him in the courtroom? Are we fit to stand before a holy God? Of course, the answer is no. We're not. But there's some, there's some things that God reveals in this that I think are important. One thing he reveals is he says, I will send a messenger. Now, I believe that this is a, this is a bit of a picture of John the Baptist. This prepares us for when we get into the Gospels and when we open up Matthew, when we, when we turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament and we start to, to see that the Savior is coming, Emmanuel, God with us, is coming in fulfillment of what Malachi says, one of the things that we'll discover in the Gospels, of course, is, is that there's a messenger that comes before him. Now, let me take you to Isaiah. Isaiah also describes a messenger. He describes it this way in Isaiah 40, the third verse. He says... The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so Malachi, I believe, picks up on the same kind of message that Isaiah has about a messenger that comes, a messenger of preparation, a messenger that prepares the way of the Lord. Now look with me to Matthew, the the third chapter and the first three verses there, because I think this is the gospel fulfillment of that preparation. It says this. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. What's the message of John the Baptist? You, if you've heard the Gospels, what's the message of John the Baptist? He came saying, Repent, didn't he? He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Malachi says, the Lord is coming. Malachi says, prepare the way for the Savior. Malachi says, there's a messenger coming, and the messenger is going to have a a particular message. The message in Matthew, as, as revealed of John the Baptist, was... A message of repentance. Let's think about repentance for a moment. Why? Why was his message repent? It's interesting because I think we're we're also prepared, and and this is one of the things that I've enjoyed. I have I have I have enjoyed walking through the Old Testament so much with you. I have enjoyed Seeing how God is revealed and the message to us from God has been revealed. I've enjoyed it because one of the things that I love about it is, is, is how it prepares us for Jesus. How it prepares us for the Savior. How it prepares us for His coming and for His death on the cross and His resurrection, His ascension. How it prepares us for His return. I've enjoyed that. And one of the things that I marvel at is how, how it fits together so beautifully. The message of John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus was repent. Do you remember what we we saw in Zechariah when Zechariah in the first chapter said, return to the Lord and he will return to you. And and we said that, that the message of Zechariah, it echoes forward in time to To the book of James where James says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. And now we get in Malachi. We get in the last book of the Old Testament. 
And, and, and Malachi, lo and behold, he says the same thing in chapter 3 and verse 7. He says, and, and what the Lord says is, return to me and I will return to you. What I find interesting is, and, and we've talked about the chronology of the Old Testament a little bit, that, that Zechariah and Malachi are actually uh, chronologically akin to Ezra and Nehemiah. In that time frame when the exiles have returned to Jerusalem and they're there's a rebuilding. There's a rebuilding of the temple, a rebuilding of the city, a rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. If you look at the prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 1 and verse 9, as Nehemiah prays, and God's moved upon his heart to go back to Jerusalem, and God will give him a vision to rebuild the wall around the city, which he accomplishes in 52 days. If you go back to the prayer of Nehemiah, I find it interesting because he hearkens back to God's covenant with Moses. And when Nehemiah prays, he prays about the return to God. So whether you're looking at Nehemiah or Zechariah or Malachi or James, riding after Jesus has been crucified, there is a, there's a message that reverberates and that message is return to God. And God will return to you. It doesn't surprise me that that, that when this messenger comes, John the Baptist, it doesn't surprise me that God says, God throws out this big question and he says, who will be able to stand in the presence of the Lord? Who will be able to stand in the message from John the Baptist to prepare the way for the Savior who is coming is repent. And what does repent mean? It means to turn to the Lord. It's the same message. There's a beautiful alignment in what God says. There's a beautiful message throughout the Old Testament. And it, and it carries us into the New Testament where we're, we're, we're prepared for Jesus to come. To live a perfect life. To be a spotless sacrifice for us. To die on the cross for our sins. And that message is simply this. Repent. Return to God. Change direction. Turn to God because the Lord will come. The Lord will come. And he did and he came. And the message to us today is the same. Turn to him. Return to God. I don't know where you are in your life today. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But I do know this. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter which direction you've gone. It doesn't matter how you've strayed. It doesn't matter. The message is the same for you. Turn to God. Turn to God. Return to Him. Run to Him. Jesus would communicate this beautifully in the story of, of what we call the prodigal. It is the, the fact that he, this, this son who, who ran away wakes up one day and realizes, I need to return back. I need to go back home. I need to return to my father. I need to find my way back home. It's the message of the Old Testament. It's the message of the New Testament. It's the message of Malachi. It's the message of John the Baptist. Return. Now, why is this so important? Here, here's where I want to get into the beauty of this description of God. Because it says, Malachi gives us a picture of God and an understanding of who God is. As I said, God is a refiner. He's, he's like launderer's soap in Malachi. Interesting descriptions of God. Why are these descriptions given? Because something has happened. When we started on this journey in Genesis, as I said, it begins. And, and Genesis 127 describes the creation of God. It describes the fact that God made us in his image. And as you continue reading in that passage, there comes a point to where God sees his creation and he says, it was very good. God created us in his image and was very good, but something happened. Sin begins to taint the beauty. Sin begins to change and distort that image. Sin begins to take a toll and so God comes along, and so now God is not, he's not portrayed as that same creator 
that takes the dust of the earth and he shapes it and he molds it and he makes us in his image. God's a different, a different type of creator, a different type of artisan, a different type of craftsman, a different type of potter. This time God is a refiner. Now, now what, is, what does a refiner do? A refiner, the job of the refining is to get the impurities out. The job of a refiner is, is to take that and to, you see, a refiner looks and sees that the beauty is in there. He sees the, the finished product before it is finished. The refiner is able to look at the impurities and look through the impurities and see that, in fact, there is a process that will unlock the purity, that will unlock the beauty that will unlock the finished product, that will, that will be able to separate that which is good from that which is evil. Now, remember again the context of Malachi. Remember the questions here where they say, where is the God of justice? They're calling evil good and good evil. And they're saying that God is pleased with what is evil. And of course that's not the case. And God responds to that and says, yes, the Lord is coming. Yes, the Lord is coming, but you better prepare. You better prepare. How do you prepare? Well, John the Baptist, the messenger, helps us understand. You prepare through repentance. But repentance, as far as our act, as far as what we can do, repentance is not enough because we require, we need, we must have a refiner. We must have a God who is willing to be personally involved in the process. Listen carefully as Malachi describes. He says that the refiner sits. He sits. God as the refiner sits. And, and if you think in terms of a potter and the clay, it's that, it's that overseeing of the process. Only it's not a process just to shape and to mold. It's a process of refining. It's a process. It's more of the crucible of life. It's more of the, of the separation of what is pure from what is impure. God is personally involved in that process. He is not only the refiner who oversees, but Malachi would say he is, he is the refiner's fire. God is the fire. God separates what is impure from what is pure in us. God is the launderer's soap. God cleanses what we can never clean. God comes in and God is involved in our lives. And, and, and though our repentance is important, that repentance, that repentance alone is not enough. God gets involved and washes us and cleanses us. And in New Testament terms, God, God tells us through the writings of the Apostle Paul that his desire is to have a bride that is spotless, well, our repentance, we know that God wants us to be pure and to be clean and to be spotless. And so we turn to Him. Why do we turn to Him? Because we can never get there on our own. We can never get there on our own. It's impossible. Who can stand in the presence of a holy God? You say, where is the God of justice, God? Set things right. Make things right. Intervene, God. Oh, really? Is that what you want? Okay, God says, I am coming. But who's able to stand in my presence? Because God is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. We can stand. We turn to him. We turn away from our sin and we turn to him. And what does God do? God personally begins to refine us. Now, if you know anything about fire, we use that phrase a lot, trial by fire. What that means is that those are tough experiences that sanctify us, that purify us. 
that change us, that transform us. If you know anything about soap, I just, you know, I, I didn't think I'd ever share a testimony of how fun it is to pull weeds, but I've been in a sling for six weeks. And it's amazing the things you find enjoyment in after being in a sling for six weeks. And so out in the, in the 17 seconds yesterday that it didn't rain, I decided to take advantage of that, and I pulled some weeds, and it was glorious to get to pull weeds. And I got grass stains and mud, and, and you know, it's, it was just great. It was great. But, but you know, getting grass stains off your hand is not pretty. There are all kinds of home remedies for that. There's gasoline. It works, but then you smell like gasoline for days. There's lemon juice. It works. Uh, there's sandpaper. There's lots of my own home remedies that I've used. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, you know, you can, you can use lots of things, but the truth is, is there's, this, there's no gentle and easy way to get the stains off your hands. Can I get a witness? God is like launderer's soap. And there have been times in my life that, that God has been the gentle hand soap. You know, Lynn buys this frou-frou. It's, uh, it's, 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 I don't know what my hands smell like. Ginger, what is it? It's, I don't know what it is. But that's sort of the low end. And then there's lava and lye and gojo. And, you know, that's, where, that's, that's a long way from the ginger coconut smell that you get. Can I just tell you, the ginger coconut's wonderful, but it won't get grass stains. It won't get grass stains off your hand. You need to amp it up. There are times in our lives that, that God is sort of like the ginger soap. There are other times in our life that God is more like the sandpaper, where God knows that, that through, he's a refiner's fire. What's the goal? The goal is, take us back, God, to Genesis 127, where God creates us in his image. And the truth is, is his image is beautiful. When God made us, he made us beautiful. He made us his creation. And he saw that it was very good. And what God knows is that sin damages that. Sin ruins that. Sin destroys our ability to reflect God, the image of God. And so God says, what I need, I need for you to return to me because I and I alone can wash you and cleanse you and transform you and redeem you and, and take back what has been damaged. But what God has promised us in that is that I, I am the refiner's fire. You see, see, there is no third party refiner with God. God does it himself. There, there is no third-party cleanser with God. God says, I know what is required, and I love you so much. Here's how the cleansing is going to take place. I love you so much that I know we can't get it right until I come and die on the cross. I come, and I am present for that. God does that for us. I'm going to invite Sam and... Tiffany and Andrew to come up. They're going to sing a song for us as we close in a time of prayer. This is a reminder of how God sees you today and how God sees me today. Who can stand in God's presence? None of us can apart from his grace and his mercy. But here's what God wants to do in your life. God wants to take you that same creator God, that same refiner's fire, that same launderer. So God wants to take you where you are today and wash you, and cleanse you, and forgive you, and shape you, and mold you. What kind of God do we see revealed in the Old Testament? Here's the kind of God we see revealed. God is a God who's able to take us and to make us beautiful. Turn to him today. Bring your life to God and say, God, wash me. Refine me. God, shape me and mold me. God, take the mess that I've made and make me beautiful again. God, make me beautiful.
pray that this song speaks to your heart today. We're going to close in prayer at the end of this song. Let God work in your life today. Let him minister to you.